All right, hello everybody. Hope that you're doing well today. Uh, we have a great discussion that's going to take place today uh, with a friend of mine uh, by the name of Jason Barnes. Um, of course, we sequestered the greatest names in all of exoplanet science between the two of us. Uh, there's a third uh, Jason that's also important in this scene, but he's Canadian, so we don't talk about him very much. Um, so Jason Barnes, welcome. Thanks, man. Good so, to be here. Why don't you tell us about who you are and uh, and what you're doing and how you got to wear such a great shirt. Sure. So I'm uh, a professor at the, in physics at the University of Idaho. Um, and, uh, you know, with Jason Steffen, I was a postdoc for the Kepler mission back in the day. Um, and uh, Jason Rowe is the third Jason of the triumvirate um, that we that we would uh, do Kepler science with. Uh, it's amazing. You look at uh, the name Jason, like there's a huge spike in the mid 70s. So all of us are yeah. the same. We're all the same. We're all age. the same age. We're all, we're all the same cohort uh, moving forward. But these days, uh, I'm working on a new mission uh, called Dragonfly, which would fly uh, a half ton nuclear powered quadcopter on Saturn's moon Titan. Very cool. Uh, what's your what's your background? Um, how did you get to be in this position? I did my undergrad uh, in astronomy at Caltech, and then I was a postdoc or a, a graduate student at the University of Arizona uh, before I worked uh, for Kepler and Cassini, both as my postdocs, and then I came here to the University of Idaho. So I've been a planetary scientist pretty much uh, my whole life doing planets, uh, both inside and outside the solar system. Okay. And how does, how does planetary science differ from astronomy? Well, that's a great question. I mean, uh, planetary science is a subset of astronomy, essentially, the subset of astronomy that, that, that concerns itself with planets, which are substantially different in a lot of ways than stars and um, galaxies and that sort of thing. Um, what's, I think, one of the most distinctive features of planetary science is that we tend to focus very intensely on particular targets, like Mars. You recently saw this Mars landing. We have, like, eight operating spacecraft around Mars now, uh, the planet Earth does. Um, and so we're studying that planet very closely. Uh, typically in astronomy and actually in exoplanet science as well, we tend to study populations of objects uh, as a whole, as opposed to individual objects um, in particular. So one of the reasons we can do that, of course, is that in planetary science, we can actually visit our targets in the solar system anyway, if not in other solar systems. Mm -hmm. And how did you get like, what role did you play on Cassini, um, and how does that compare with what you did on Kepler? Sure. So I started on Cassini the same way uh, I did at Kepler. I was a, I was a postdoc uh, working for uh, one of the instruments, the Visual and Infrared Mapping Spectrometer, uh, and I was working, I keep for myself uh, the task of investigating Saturn's moon Titan um, using that instrument. Um, I started on uh, Kepler the same way as a postdoc. Uh, a postdoctoral scientist working for the mission. Eventually, I became a participating scientist on Cassini, the same way I believe you were on Kepler, right? Uh -huh. You were a participating scientist. So eventually, I so I we got get to we get to come in as participating scientists. All the hard work has been done, and we get to take all the glory. Exactly, it's glorious, dude. <laughs> um, you get to write over all the papers. I think um, I have more uh, actual papers written from um, the Cassini instrument I worked with than the people that are actually on the team. Because as a postdoc, you have that opportunity to just sit back and do all the science uh, while other people are doing the hard work of the mission planning and getting the mission funded and all that sort of thing. So with uh, Dragonfly, I'm sort of on the other end. Uh, I'm doing the, <laughs> the, the hard work uh, up front. Um, and I know that the future young people, maybe some people in the audience will jump in come 2035 and uh, do some great science with so th it. So this will be all the people that were born in the 90s. Does that mean they're all Kevin or something? Is uh, Or Aiden or something? What's what's the... <laughs> Whatever the popular <laughs> name was in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when... Now, when it comes to, like, the Cassini mission, how does the... What are the data like, and how do they differ from, like, data from Kepler? Sure. So, I mean, Cassini uh, was a, what, one of the... Uh, NASA's flagship missions, right? So the really big, ambitious missions that had like 18 instruments. Um, and so Cassini was a really multi, 
multi-threat. It's like one of those um, painter's tools that has the scraper well, and the... Special Army knife or something. It has everything, right? Okay? So, like, I was uh, involved with the radar instrument and the near-infrared uh, <clears throat> mapping spectrometer and the camera, uh, whereas, like, Kepler is exactly the opposite. There's only one instrument on Kepler, okay? It's a mm -hmm. big, fat camera. Um, and so that's sort of the, the distinction. Everyone works with, with the same kind of data for Kepler, but for Cassini, there's just widely disparate fields and people working on very different things, very different instruments, uh, very different interests, looking at different targets. Um, and so it's a sort of a um, similar in some ways, but but very different uh, sort of in the, the details of how that science gets done. And so with these, in so, these like planetary missions are essentially like platforms for hosting a variety of different instruments is what it, it seems like flagship missions are so <laughs> flagship missions uh you know nasa decides like they're designing a mission right now to europa and they said okay this could be a europa mission everyone proposed science instruments that you might send so people proposed a, a radar to measure how deep the the ice is on europa and they proposed a camera and they proposed gravity science to measure uh, the interior properties and magnetometers and mass spectrometers to see if there's material, uh, pl potential plume material you could measure the composition of. Uh, whereas the kind of missions that um, uh, Dragonfly and Kepler were are competed missions. So this is like a totally different way of doing things. Back in the 90s, um, the missions had gotten so big that they only flew one a decade. And so they're like, we need some mechanism to fly smaller missions. So they put up um, uh, opportunities to propose. So they're like, hey, you got $300 million. Everyone propose what mission you want to do with that money and we'll fund the best one. Uh, and so Kepler was one of the discovery missions chosen about uh, 99 or 2000, as I recall. Um, yeah, I remember um, it was it was right around then as well because that's basically when i started graduate school and um i saw the the gif on their website where they were all celebrating that they got selected yeah you know the, the well, mission itself was in design for since the early 1980s they proposed that mission five or six times before they got selected i mean the competitive process as you can imagine uh -huh. this is like one of the most competitive things out there, right? I mean, everyone wants to, wouldn't you love to have half a billion dollars to fly a mission wherever you wanted? So would everyone else, okay? So typically for discovery missions, they get 20 or 30 mission proposals. Um, and each of those are great ideas by great people that have been, had millions of dollars thrown into them, uh, investigating them. Uh, and so it's, I now understand how excited they were when they got selected. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a, and it's a long road to get there. Uh -huh. So with Dragonfly, how did, how was that process um, developed and how does that compare to like the, so is Discovery class, is that, <clears throat> is that a NASA mission as a whole or is that a science mission directorate type mission? Like where does the Discovery class emanate from and how does yeah, it? So this Discovery class missions are in the planetary science mission directorate, uh, which is interesting that that you know Kepler was chosen there. Unfortunately, astrophysics, where exoplanets tends to work, they don't have any mechanism like this. They have very small uh, mission opportunities, like Explorer, like um, Tess. Co yeah, Kobe um, was like that. Yeah, which is like a hundred or hundred fifty million, uh, and then they have unbelievably gigantic Battlestar Galactica missions, like JB JWST, which is ten billion dollars. <laughs> And, and literally, <laughs> there's nothing between 100 million and 10 billion in astrophysics. And like you guys desperately need it. We desperately would love need people to be able to propose, you know, mid-scale focused astrophysics missions. I mm -hmm. think. Okay, maybe I'm biased. So, um, so that's like, um, so, so we're like a banana republic um, where <laughs> there's a few missions that get all the money, and then a, a bunch of smaller ones. Because Tess, uh, I think it was a 250 million dollar cap for Tess. I don't remember. I don't think that that includes the launch vehicle. Um, with I think that they price it, including the launch vehicle with Kepler. They had to adjust things because it needed more fuel to get into its orbit. I don't recall exactly, but you know, there's a weird accounting. Like sometimes you count the launch vehicle, and sometimes you don't. Yeah, they usually um, in the NASA competition, they say, look, if you launch on our ch smallest, cheapest launch vehicle, that's included. If you need a bigger launch vehicle, it counts against your cost. Oh, yeah. OK, so that, that explains what happened with tests, because with tests, they did have to make some adjustments because their launch was not into low Earth orbit. Um, 
because a low earth orbit is cheap you can do that for 50 bucks or whatever um yeah and the but they're in this weird um originally proprietary like super secret orbit that uh is in a resonance with the moon and because right. it's a higher orbit you needed more fuel to get up there and so they had to balance it out with their other costs rocket. exactly exactly so it's the same situation um in most of the competitions right so if you get it you can always get a bigger rocket but it costs you a little bit against your cost cap right? mm -hmm. and so how does uh dragonfly fit into this um in terms of its scale and 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 the process to select it how was how did that go yeah so uh dragonfly is a, a bigger yet class of mission uh the discovery missions were are typically about half a billion these days uh, and they worked well enough that uh, Planetary Science Mission Directorate decided to do a, a larger set of missions called New Frontiers. So New Frontiers missions, uh, our competition had an $850 million PI managed cost cap. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't include the rocket and the, um, uh, the science after you launch and that sort of thing. Uh, and there've only been, we're the fourth New Frontiers mission. So the other New Frontiers missions are ones you may have heard of. There's Juno. Mm -hmm. um, orbiting Jupiter and uh, New Horizons, which is okay. the Pluto flyby. So that's actually pretty old because New Horizons, you know, took like 15 years to get there or something. Uh, 10 years to get there. Yeah, they were select. They were the very first one selected. Actually, they were kind of grandfathered in. Um, they were kind of, you know, the program was kind of new. They're like, hey, let's turn this Pluto thing into the New Frontiers uh -huh. competition. Post hoc. So, <laughs> the first one was a little, a little, little sketchy as to how it got going. Um, but, uh, yeah, they've already, you know, essentially finished their missions. So there's only one or two of these selected a decade. It's supposed to be two. It's more like one typically. Uh -huh. Um, but there, we had 12 total competitors, uh, in our competition and it was, it was fierce. Wow. And, uh, so it's a PI led, which means that there's someone in charge, um, as opposed to like a flagship mission, which is owned by NASA. Um, and what, uh, is it going to be run out of JPL? Is that where the... Because that seems to be where most of the planetary science stuff is managed is out of JPL. So there are three different centers that can fly missions. There's JPL in California. There's NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And there's the uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, which is also Maryland. Ours is actually being flown out well, of... Well, that's not even fair. They get two? <laughs> I know. Maryland Maryland has a double, double duty. So we're at APL in Maryland, actually. We'll be running our mission. Oh, These okay. are the same ones that ran the New Horizons probe that flew by Pluto and Messenger, which flew by, uh, which orbited uh, Mercury. Uh, and so they have a history of, uh, in the ancient past, they you know, were doing mostly Navy missions, but they've, they've branched out into doing some very um, competitive planetary missions mm -hmm. uh, in recent decades. Okay. And uh, so what is Dragonfly? So Dragonfly is this crazy idea where uh, Titan is the only moon in our solar system with a thick atmosphere. In fact, it's thicker than Earth's. Uh, at the surface, the density of the atmosphere is four times as dense as Earth's atmosphere. And the gravity is seven times lower. So we've been thinking about how to explore Titan um, in the same way that we've explored Mars with rovers to be able to not just land in one place, but to be able to uh, you know, follow up on discoveries and investigate what we found there. Uh, and so the idea we hit upon was that at Titan, uh, it's easier to fly than to drive. So uh, we have a, basically a lander that spends almost all of its time on the ground uh, investigating the weather and the chemistry um, and seismology and that sort of thing. And once every two months or so, we take off, or once every month, every two Titan days, uh, we take off, we're able to fly uh, for up to tens of kilometers uh, and land and investigate a new site afterward. So does that mean that Titan's orbit is like uh, two weeks? Is that? Yeah, it's orbital period around Saturn is 16 days. Yep. Okay. And we're a direct to Earth communicator. We don't have an orbital relay. So we can only talk to Earth for eight days at a time. So we talk to Earth for eight days and then we go into night and we charge our battery and all of us get to rest. Uh, <laughs> Unlike the Mars people that... <laughs> But, yeah, they're on those, that 24 and a half hour day. No, we don't have any of that. Uh -huh. Oh, so well, one thing that was pointed out, someone mentioned um, I, that I should clarify is that a PI led mission means it's a principal investigator. Um, yes. As opposed to so, yeah, so that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, PI led missions. Um, yeah. The normal like Cassini, there was no one person in charge. There was a mission manager up at JPL eventually, um, uh, but there was no one person sort of that was running the whole show. PI-led missions are proposed with a single person at the top that's a scientist running the mission. So our principal investigator is Dr. Elizabeth Turtle, who's at the Applied Physics Laboratory there. 
Uh, and I'm the deputy principal investigator, so I'm kind of like the vice president of the mission. Mm -hmm. So, um, with that, what is uh, how big is the mission science team? So we've got about forty, probably um, co co investigators, maybe thirty, maybe low thirty, sort of uh, official. But after you get selected, you sort of start to realize there's people you need and people you want to bring on board. Mm -hmm. So it's a hence very the, large operation. Hence the uh, the uh, participating scientist program. And yeah, eventually we we will have a participating scientist to uh, program two that's. We, we've designed it to start one year before we arrive. So probably like 2033 or something, mm -hmm. uh, there'll be a call um, and we'll select people to bring, in order to bring them on sort of maybe a year before arrival so that we can hit the ground running uh, once we land. Okay, and then, okay, so with, it was selected. Um, there were a whole bunch of other people that were also proposing things all within planetary science. So these are all missions that could potentially go to um, something in the solar system. Um, right, so there were um, a moon, sample return mission uh two or three comet sample return missions proposed um a venus lander uh, a saturn probe and uh and in a couple of missions to saturn's moon enceladus were our competitors hmm. and another titan mission actually a titan orbiter wow so um i hadn't anticipated so why would oh so europa a mission to europa is basically owned by nasa um, yeah. And so the Enceladus thing would make sense as a smaller scale one. Um, exactly. Exactly. So you know, they figure they've got Europa covered, and so maybe you can do Enceladus for cheap. Kind of, kind of like what happened. Um, that happened with the cosmic microwave background radiation, where they were going to launch a big thing, and someone was like, "Hey, we can make the same measurement if we just put a balloon up in the air." Um, and we can make <laughs> like one small narrow measurement if we put a balloon in the air, and then it costs a lot less, and so we can, um, you yeah. know, save ourselves. From there um yeah i mean in a lot of ways that these competed missions are a bit like that they're more focused right they don't have 18 instruments like cassini did uh we only have four instruments for instance on dragonfly uh -huh. what, uh, are, the, what are the what are the instruments we got eight cameras uh we have uh, a weather monitoring suite um and a seismometer sort of our ge ge uh, geophysics and, and meteorology suite and then we have two chemistry experiments. One is a gamma ray neutron spectrometer to measure the elemental composition of what's around us. Mm -hmm. And then our flagship instrument is a mass spectrometer where we uh, suck in surface material and run it through the mass spectrometer to determine what it's made of. Mm -hmm. So with this, because this is a quadcopter, uh, was there any, is there, are there any issues with having the technology capable like do going through the technical readiness i don't know the certification and is that and what role does the um does the helicopter on mars play in preparing the way for dragonfly yeah so we we sort of started up before the mars helicopter so i don't think they they're not a pathfinder specifically in any way of course all all flight on other planets is exciting if you ask me so i'm very excited and, and wishing them the, great, the greatest success i'm looking forward to seeing videos of that flight, uh, which should come in the next couple of weeks, I think. Um, but really, I mean, if we proposed this 20 years ago when Kepler sele was selected, we'd have been laughed out of the room, okay, because it was crazy. Nowadays, you can, you know, just, you know, end up at Walmart and, and buy one of these things for 20 bucks that does crazy amazing things, uh, you know, like follow mm -hmm. you around. Uh, so really, the technology has already been demonstrated. We really aren't. Uh, we don't have any new technology developments. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, you know an application of this new technology in uh, you know a different way uh, and in a different uh, you know a different sort of a different environment. Okay, so I could imagine um, that that was probably in part because of the fact that Titan's atmosphere is so similar in pressure as and probably molecular weight as well. It's a little bit thicker. Um, but yeah, uh, so that because the atmosphere is so similar to the Earth, you don't have to worry about the fact that with one percent the atmosphere, the blades are going to have to spin around at some level that you wouldn't see with an Earth. Exactly, Titan is actually the the most similar place uh, in the solar system to Earth to be able to fly in. Not only is the so the pressure there is one and a half times the pressure here. I mean, the density is four times, um, just because it's so cold, right? The temperature there is ninety Kelvin, so. Uh, you know, the ideal gas law says that the, the gases have to be denser, but that's actually pretty close, right? The atmosphere at, at Venus is 100 times thicker. The mm -hmm. atmosphere at Mars is 100 times thinner. Um, this is the Goldilocks zone. It's yes. very similar. So it's a factor of pi, which means it's the same. 
<laughs> I mean, it's even within a factor of two. I mean, it's really close. Um, but the other uh, really enabling uh, aspect for testing is that the composition of Titan's atmosphere is the same as ours, mostly nitrogen. Uh, so you can actually just, you don't even need to do, to do a test on Earth. You just need to kind of cool it down and you really have very similar conditions. So uh, it, it's a night, what, what is the composition of the atmosphere? Like what are the, what are the details of it? It's almost all nitrogen. Um, the other primary constituent is methane. And methane on Titan plays the same role that water does on Earth because it's sort of near its triple point. So methane will form clouds and rain um, and uh, pools at the poles in seas of liquid methane. And because of that, uh, the relative humidity of methane can vary between like two and five percent. Oh, wow, that's really that's interesting. And methane is actually lighter than the nitrogen. So the same way that water really? is lighter than the nitrogen. Um, exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, the main instrument is this mass spectrometer. Uh, how does how does that get fed, and and what do you like? So how when when you you pick up a sample, so you have a vacuum cleaner, you you suck up a bunch of stuff. Um, how does that sample get digested and then analyzed? Well, actually, the vacuum cleaner itself is kind of an, an innovation, right? I mean, when they do sampling on Mars, they usually have these like robot arms that gotta like lift stuff up and try to do crazy things with them. Like if you see this uh, sampler that they've got uh, on the new rover, right? It's like drilling cores and it's got this incredibly complicated robot arm system to put the cores here and do this crazy stuff with it. Um, yeah, we have two people at UNLV out. that that are on that one. We have one participating scientist and one who's a, a primary scientist working on like sample selection, I think, um, from our Sweet. geoscience so department. Uh, in geoscience, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, no, that, I mean, that, I think we are in many ways sort of, you know, the, the a similar um, kind of investigation that they've been doing at Mars lately. Um, but uh, because Titan's ambient atmosphere there is about, it has has atmospheric pressure, you can use that pressure to, to ingest materials uh, sort of the same way that, uh, you know, you ingest stuff from your rug, you just okay. vacuum it up. Um, and oh, so you, you, could, you wouldn't really up, be able to do a vacuum on Mars. You'd have to suck a hundred times harder to... It's crazy. I mean, you can't suck harder, right? I mean, there's nothing to it, suck it, on. It, it's 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 vacuum, okay? So there's just that's it. Once you get to vacuum, zero, there's zero. There's all you can. So it totally would not work on Mars. On Venus, of course, you'd be ingesting material that's 700 Kelvin. It would be like a blowtorch. I mean, that's also not a good. Idea. <laughs> so, really, this is the only other place uh, in the universe other than Earth that that a vacuum cleaner would work. Um, so we're really we're really kind of we're kind of proud that like that, the space that, balls. That. Are you going to put a space balls logo with the vac <laughs> vacuum cleaner? <laughs> We we've literally thought about what if it gets clogged that we have it go from suck to blow, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, maybe we have the, the, we didn't do that before selection because we didn't have the money, but we we definitely consider that. Uh -huh. um, but in order to not get it clogged, we we actually saw in mostly air um, and only a very small amount of particulate material. It's about fifty to one air uh -huh. to particulates. Okay. Uh, one thing that came up is people were asking about. Um, there's no oxygen on Titan, uh, basically because there's no life. The oxygen on the Earth came from comes from life, and yep. so, uh, well, I mean, maybe we'll be surprised, but at least right now, there's no life that would be producing large amounts of oxygen to change the composition of the atmosphere. I mean, yeah, it took three billion, three and a half billion years for the amount of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere to finally build up to to, to an appreciable level. Yeah, and to so rust everything like first, that. and then. <laughs> Yeah, um, basically everything had to rust and 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 and, get, and just get everything that would react with oxygen had to be reacted with oxygen and and, and sequestered before uh, it could build up. So there's nothing that extensive, evidently, on Titan. Um, although we are looking for chemical signatures of life, both those that might exist in the subsurface ocean beneath Titan, uh, Titan's outer crust, and within these lakes and seas of methane at the poles. We don't know if life would be possible in liquid methane. Um, there's a lot of reasons to think it wouldn't, but mm -hmm. we didn't think there was going to be life at, uh, you know, the deep sea, the bottom of the ocean or in highly acidic environments either. So it could, life continues to surprise us. So we're allowing for that possibility. Yeah. Well, now when it comes to, um, well, let's finish the sample selection. Okay. So you, you land someplace, you pull in a bunch of basically surface dust. Um, you can't really control the particle size other than I guess by how hard you pull. Um, we have a drill, um, so actually we, you know, even solid materials we can we'll drill into them, but we're not we're not going to take a core out. We drill into them to turn the solid material into particulates that we can then ingest with the with the. Vacuum. Okay, and then what 
what do you do with that um, with those particles once you have them? So once they get sucked in um, and we get them into the mass spectrometer, we have a couple different ways we can analyze them. One is we just heat them up uh, and uh, run those molecules through uh, uh, a mass spectrometer that basically the bigger molecules take longer to go through. Um, and so that uh, allows us to measure their molecular mass, uh, which isn't exactly their composition, but allows us to infer the composition from. The second way we can do it is uh, we'll zap them with a laser, which kind of busts them into little bits, uh, which then you can you can measure the, the mass of the bits. And that sort of helps you get at what the how, how the um, uh, material of a given molecular mass gets built up. Um, by you know blasting it into bits and looking at the mass of the individual mm -hmm. bits. So can do you get down to the atomic level? Uh... Not for not for the mass spectrometer. So we're just looking at molecular mass with the mass spectrometer. We do uh -huh. also have this gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. So that doesn't ingest. Oh, that, I'm sorry. That's what I, that's what I meant to say. So you, you can get down yeah. to molecule individual molecules with these different processes. We get to in, we get to individual molecules with the mass spectrometer. Individual individual atoms with the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. So the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer spits gamma ray, uh, neutrons into the surface, which knock out electrons. Uh, and then those individual atoms will release gamma rays. And the number of gamma rays we get is characteristic of the elements involved, right? Is there oxygen? Is uh -huh. there sodium or whatever? But not the molecules. Okay, and what so do you use? Kind of complementary instruments. What does it use as a source for the neutrons? Um, we have a fusion generator. It's literally a fusion generator. Uh, it's this little, it's a linear um, accelerator where we got a bunch of uh, deuterium and tritium, and we shoot shoot the tritium at the deuterium uh, at very high speed, uh, and that generates neutrons. I'm, I'm serious. Wow, it's that's, a fusion uh, generator. that's I mean, cool. It doesn't generate energy, but uh -huh. it's a fusion generator. Turns out uh, they, they use these all the time in oil wells on Earth to do the mm -hmm. same thing, right? They run this, one of these, they do a, a, a drill, down a kilometer through the crust, and they run these neutron generators down through it uh, to be able to look at the composition of the rock around them. So really, it's actually just a, a, an oil well neutron generator that we've got uh, repurposed and space um, qualified. And then, so with this thing, um, where do you get your tritium from? Uh, we bring it with us. Um, the problem is it's got a half-life that's uh, you know comparable to the length of the mission. Uh, so we have to bring a whole lot of it with us. And so it is a finite resource. We will eventually uh, run out. Uh, and, and not be able but to. like, do you get it from a national lab or from a nuclear reactor somewhere or? I don't know if they tell me that much. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I actually like don't We know get it from where, Canada? Where, where, that, where the actual source is. I mean, um, it's a good question. I don't know that one. Okay, because I, I know that I you do. Us, us vice presidents that much. Okay, so that. My suspicion is, uh, I can't confirm this, but my suspicion is that that's probably like a nuclear reactor byproduct. Um, that's what I would guess, because um, they probably generate a whole bunch of it that they don't need. But so you have to generate it right before. Um, I forget what the half-life of tritium is. It's like five or six years or something. So you're running, so you both have to, because you also have to get the deuterium to, to bring years. along with you, so. Yes, um, 12 years, okay. Wow, that's that's cool. So, Mr. Fusion on a helicopter yeah, on a they, moon around Saturn. <laughs> it sounds crazy when you that's... put it that way, but but it's true. So we're not generating energy out of it, right? It's not like a it's not like yeah, an actual Mr. Fusion, but, cons... but that is that is the source of neutrons. Uh huh. And then uh, now the power source for the whole spacecraft. Oh, okay. Hold on. Um, all right. So that that's the primary instrument is is going around doing this stuff. Uh, one thing that I asked you when you spoke uh, at the at our university was, um, how do you keep the vacuum clean so that you don't contaminate it from one site to the other? Yeah, we are worried about that. Um, there's really basically no way to keep it entirely clean. We are, there is gonna be some cross contamination, but the way we deal with cross, the contamination is to just totally overwhelm the cam contamination with signal. Okay. Um, thankfully, we're sitting there on the surface, and we can just vacuum up grams and grams of stuff. I mean, as much as we need okay. to be yeah. able to overwhelm any previous signal. And this is kind of different than like you know, our competitor Enceladus missions, for instance, would be flying through this very diffuse plume at six kilometers per second, and they were gaining, you know, nanograms of of sample on each flyby. And we just have so much sample. Um, that's our strategy. Our primary strategy is to just overwhelm it. Mm -hmm. We are careful about. You know, if we if we look at material and it has a, a, a strange 
uh, viscosity like like molasses or something. We don't want to suck that in and have that get gum up. Oh, okay, so um, before you turn the vacuum on, you're going to do a bunch of kind of surface level, um, like stir the pot, see, you know, exactly. is the mud going to stick to your... see what the drill does. We got cameras. We have a high resolution camera uh, pointed at the drill site to look at the, the, the physical properties of the surface. Mm -hmm. That's one of the key criteria that we're going to look at prior to... Um, uh, you know, sampling to make sure that it's stuff that looks like it's it's going to be uh, not going to gum us up. And then when you have this, uh, how many different sites do you think you'll be able to visit in a primary mission? And then presumably this is something where the as long as the spacecraft is operating, they're going to keep it running. Um... Yeah, we hope so. Um, we think 20 or 30 sites probably for the prime mission. We're going to land in Titan sand dunes uh, like the ones you see behind me here. Um, because uh, those sand dunes are made of organic material that we think may have been sourced from the lakes and seas. Uh, and then we're going to fly toward an impact crater. Titan's crust is made of water ice. So there's this giant impact crater called Selk Crater um, that when it was created, uh, we think the impactor created a pool of liquid water on the surface of Titan. So we really want to get to that liquid, previously liquid water pool. Mm -hmm. Uh, now so that would have that would have been delivered by the impactor or water that was kind of in the surface already. So the surface is made of water. So oh, okay. this is just melted. So uh, Titan's outer crust is maybe a hundred kilometers thick water ice. Really? Um, but I didn't. Okay, really, that's uh, that's news to me. I didn't appreciate that. Yeah. So that makes it easier. But yeah, one of these things when the asteroid slams into you at fifteen kilometers per second, uh, there's a lot of kinetic energy. And most of that energy goes to melting the target rock, which mm -hmm. in this case, the target rock is water ice. So uh, now when you say it's water ice, what what is it really? Is it, uh, it it's not like uh, hockey rink ice. It's it's going to be mixed in with a bunch of, is it hydrated minerals or is it um, like a, a, a light dusting of of things? And, and and how would, how do you know this? Like, how do we know what the surface is made out of? We don't. So that's okay. what we're trying to find out. Um, there's this, we have this one picture from the Huygens probe that shows sort of maybe organic, uh, small organic particles and water ice rocks, maybe about the size of your fist. That's all we know. Presumably there's, um, a per we think that there may be a completely alien mineralogy there on this new planet, right? If you land on earth, yes, to us astrophysicists, you know, earth is made of rock, okay? But to the geologists, they look at it and there's all different kinds of rock. Mm -hmm. Once you get closer, like there's granite and there's basalt and there's pyroxene and there's, uh, you know, there's olivine and avine and yeah, manganese. Yeah, right. I mean, like there's all kinds of different detailed, you know, um, uh, mineralogies that we think we're going to discover on Titan, but it's actually really hard for us to even imagine what those are. Mm -hmm. So there are people working in the lab trying to mix organics and water and ice and try to figure out what those might be. But I'm sure we'll be surprised once we get there, uh, you know, what the actual surface, you know, the details of the surface mineralogy mm -hmm. might be and how it will vary. So, so where did these sand dunes come from if they, uh, if most of the surface is water ice? So uh, ultimately the, the, um, this methane in the atmosphere is actually really important. So the methane gets hit by solar ultraviolet in the outer atmosphere and busted apart. And the methane then, once it gets busted apart, it will sort of recombine into organic particles in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the the haze or smog that covers Titan that okay. prevents you from seeing the surface in the visible. But that material is like micron-sized particles that slowly fall out. Uh, and once they agglomerate on the surface, somehow they're building up into the organic sand dunes, which are a billion times more massive. But we don't know how that happens. It may happen underground or it may happen underwater. Under okay, so there's methane. this uh, atmospheric chemistry, the rain that comes off of Titan. Um, I mean, so you can get methane rain, but then you're also getting this like photochemistry stuff that's happening yeah. where, uh, so what would you make? It would be mostly nitrogen and carbon compounds. What, yeah. what are those? There's plenty, C, there's plenty of C, H, and N. Uh, there's not a lot of O. Uh -huh. um, but once you lick, once you measure, uh, mix it with liquid water, we, we've made this stuff in the lab, right? Um, you can take uh, a methane nitrogen atmosphere and just zap electricity through it, um, and you produce this dark gook that we call tholin. Uh, but when you mix that with liquid water, you very gradually form oxygen-containing compounds, which is, okay. I mean, this is what life is made of, right? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Um, and we'd really love to know how complex 
that's able to get just when you mix that stuff in liquid water. We think uh -huh. these may be the precursors of life on Earth and possibly elsewhere. Uh, and Titan, we have this great experiment, right, where we have these interesting complex yeah, carbon that is, compounds. Yeah, wow, this, with water. this is happens? making me, this is like making my brain run wild with the, the idea of building up a sand layer through percolation out of the atmosphere. Um, and then uh, the overall, like, so the oxygen, there is oxygen, we'd mentioned this before, there's no oxygen in the atmosphere because oxygen binds too readily, it's too reactive to stuff. So anything, any oxygen that's residual in the atmosphere is going to find something to latch onto, um, attach, oxidize it, and then fall to the surface. And so um, oxygen is like the third most abundant element in the universe. And then, so water is fairly common. Um, so yes. on the Earth, the overabundance comes from photosynthesis, where you basically undo that process. And, right. Uh, Earth's original atmosphere is probably mostly carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. and then that carbon dioxide was pulled out of the like atmosphere. Like what you would get plants. from what you would get from Venus and Mars. Exactly. Presumably, ours eventually originally looked like Venus or Mars, um, but but that CO two was sucked out, and the plants breathed out the oxygen, and that's what. what so where did all the nitrogen there. come from? Is that residual nitrogen? Is that why our atmosphere is a hundred times thinner than? Uh, Venus does Venus have one percent nitrogen? It does. Venus's nitrogen fraction, uh, the total partial pressure of nitrogen at Venus is the same as at Earth. Wow. Um, well, I just saw like, mystery solved. I guess. <laughs> so it's not exactly clear where it came from, but it may just be primordial. Yeah, just kind of that's the amount that gets delivered to an Earth mass planet. Uh -huh. um, and and we originally we may have started with like a ten bar. CO2 atmosphere. I mean, that plants might have had a whole lot of work to do uh -huh. to pull our atmospheric carbon dioxide out um, and leave us with the atmosphere we have today. Well, that, that is gnarly. And that's so, a that's an interesting thing. I had never thought about that. Okay, so we have yeah, this. You're like, oh, at Venus, there's only 1% nitrogen. That's as much as we have. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, all right. So in the so the water ice that we have on Titan, I know that most of the big moons in the outer solar system are all basically water ice. There's more water ice uh, on Ganymede and Europa than there is. I th there's more water on Ganymede, Europa, Callisto um, than there is on the Earth. Is Titan the same? Is Titan like a, another Ganymede? Yeah, Titan's like a, and it's an ocean world. So we think there's about 100 kilometers thick of uh, solid ice and then there's a liquid water layer. We don't know how deep that is. But it's estimated been estimated to contain maybe 10 times the total amount of water that's in earth's oceans um, beneath the surface of titan so this is really uh one of the new as you point out it, it is not uncommon in the outer solar system but it's not something we'd anticipated we thought looking for water in the universe we'd look for planets in the goldilocks zone and so it was like all about earth and mars turns out most of the liquid water in our solar system is in these outer solar system moons deep beneath the crust uh-huh and with the so this is all prediction right now like modeling here's the composition here's the density that we get and so this is what the structure would look like when it comes to you know maybe measuring the thickness of the crust is there any kind of seismology aspect to dragonfly and if so is it a single site or are you going to plant seismometers every landing spot or how how is this going to work so we do have a seismometer on board. Uh, this has been built by the Japanese space agency, JAXA. It was originally designed for their moon mission. They had a lunar penetrator that never quite worked out right. But they've done a lot more um, planning for how to build one of these than, than we have. So they have a, a very sensitive seismometer that we'll be using. Uh, because we fly around, though, um, yeah, we kind of have to deploy it. Kind of comes down on a winch. We deploy it at each, at each site once we land. Uh, but it's just a single site. Uh, but the idea is that we'll be able to, if there are Titan quakes, which, I mean, of course, we don't know if there are or not, but because Titan's in an eccentric orbit around Saturn, we think that that There's going to be some flexing, yeah. Will, will probably produce um, earthquakes. Uh, and so by measuring uh, the timing of those earthquakes, we hope to be able to get a very precise measurement of the crustal depth. We have some estimates from, like, um, precession of the rotation axis, right, uh, that okay. the outer... The outer material is decoupled from the inner material. So there's definitely a liquid layer in there somewhere. Oh, really? The, um, so you can see from the precession that, that the... Yeah, it processes faster because the mo moment of inertia of just the crust is less than that of the whole uh, the whole uh, body itself. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So it's... So there's this experiment that um, someone had done. I don't, I don't remember the details. This was like 20 years uh -huh. ago when I thought about it, where they it was a gravitational torque it was a torsion pendulum so they have this 
ball suspended by a small fiber and they're twisting it. And so those are extremely sensitive. They're like the most that those and interferometers are like the two most sensitive scientific instruments that you could imagine. Um, yeah. And they filled it with helium. So they filled it with some kind of I don't know if it was aerogel or some kind of sponge like material, something that's really porous. And yeah. they filled it with helium and then they oscillated it uh, in order to, you know, have the helium coupled to the pendulum. And then they cooled it down so that the helium became superfluid. And then they oscillated it. And now all of a sudden the helium is sitting there and the pendulum is just oscillating around it, even though it's going through a sponge because of the superfluid properties of the right. helium when they cool it down. Oh, that's so cool. And so this is yeah. like the same idea where you have the core maybe spinning at a different rate than the crust because there's a layer of ice. Um, under, like there's a what? layer of water, a layer of liquid water that allows the two things to, uh, so basically the lubricant that... Yep. Well, and, exactly. and so that would imply like there's no structures that penetrate all the way from the core all the way to the surface. It's all right. Oh, that is yep. that is cool. Yep. So we don't know how deep that water is, but it must be less several kilometers. It's probably several tens to hundreds of kilometers deep. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, it has to be deep enough that um, you don't get edge effects like too many, yeah, like, too many like edge effects that would... or something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that would mean the sound waves would propagate fairly easily through that. So um, what's well, it propagate e differently, right? Um, like through the crust, you get um, uh, you get uh, S waves, which which are, are oscillating perpendicular um, to the, the the direction of propagation. But in liquids, you only get P waves. You only get pressure waves that are uh, going uh, longitudinal to the direction of propagation. Uh -huh. So yeah, we'll be able to we'll be able to both see the depth and see the difference and verify the the you know the the liquid uh, below that if if we have enough seismic sources, which right. is the real. And challenge. what is the um, what is the eccentricity of the orbit? It's about 0.03. Okay, so that's like the moon's eccentricity is kind of similar to that. And the Earth's is about that much too, I think. Yes, uh, it's about the same. Yep. yep can can we see eccentricity-induced flexing of on the Earth? Do you know? Well, um, the sun's... Uh, because uh, the, the Earth isn't tightly locked to the sun, right? Uh, okay. We actually yeah. don't necessarily directly see it uh, in our case. But we think we may have seen it in in uh, places like Europa, which have very strong tides and are tidally locked, and they're slowly uh, librating back and forth and changing in, in intensity. But once again, that's one of the goals of this new upcoming Europa mission: will be mm -hmm. to see that tidal flexure directly, and to allow to uh, to be able to use the observation of that tidal flexure to, to infer predict what you might get. Yeah. The internal structure. Now, so is this your is the Europa mission? Uh, what is the timeline? Where does Dragonfly land in other planetary missions that are coming up? Yeah, so it takes a long time to get to the outer solar system. It's like, I, I'm so jealous of these Mars people. They just launched last July. What? They're here already. Woo! That must be great. Or like Kepler, right? Uh -huh. Kepler launched. It was already in this orbit. It started doing science. Three weeks later. We <laughs> it was crazy. It's, a, it's, a, it's not fair. Um, our nominal mission is a nine and a half year cruise out to Titan because we're trying to launch on this small rocket so that we could, uh, you know, fit within the cost cap. There's a possibility, however, that we will launch on a Falcon Heavy, which would shave several years off our, our, our trip because these days Falcon Heavies are cheaper than the cheap rockets that we thought we were going to have anyway. Uh -huh. um, and so we may be able Funny to get Funny how that works, in, right? With a... which, well, Yeah, I mean, it's an unexpected uh, consequence. So we're right now we're we're set to launch in 2027, uh -huh. uh, and if we're on a Falcon Heavy, we'll arrive in 2034. If we're not, we'll arrive 2037. Um, so it'll be quite a bit like that. Okay. Well, that saves that launching on a Falcon Heavy means that you could actually do more measurements because you'd have you wouldn't have to carry as much tritium for one thing, or you could use it. Uh, exactly. Uh, we have more power. It costs less. I mean, it costs $10 million just to leave a spacecraft in space because you got to keep all the people around, right? So we'll save a bunch of money. I think it's it's a win-win-win uh, to launch us on the big vehicle and, uh, and on the shorter trajectory. But it's not up to us. That actually, what rocket we get is that open competition. NASA will put out a bid, uh, you know, request uh -huh, for yeah, bids, yeah. and they'll, they'll, they'll select what they select, and it's not. It's kind of out of our control. Uh -huh. Now, are there? what are the other planetary missions? Uh, is this Europa mission? prior to to that launch or is it after right, the launch so, but before your arrival right now they're planning on i think right now the europa mission uh has a launch date in 2034 uh and they will arrive or, i'm sorry 2024 
and they will arrive about 2028, 2029, I think, something okay. like that. So they'll be before us. Um, so we're sort of the la- we're sort of the last one in the queue at the moment, actually. Uh-huh. Uh, we used. Well, to, you're the we, most recently selected proposed- too. So that's what it was. We were we were we were originally going to launch in 2025, and NASA was like, "Hey, you know, we need you to launch in 2027 instead because uh, the the budget wedges work out that way." So we've mm-hmm. already been pushed back a bit because we're the last ones on the queue. That's fine. I understand how that works. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, if 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 something were to happen and we were to need money in the future that we'd, 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 we'd be afforded the same, um, you know, the same uh, considerations that they have for missions that are going now. Mm-hmm. Um, so right now we're the latest ones in the queue uh, and everyone will, every, everyone else will announce, will announce, will announce, will announce, will get there before us. Uh, but there's always new missions being selected. Uh, and so eventually, you know, we'll, we'll get into the your, your rise in seniority. Um. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the closer you get to launch, I mean, think about planetary launch dates. I mean, JWST was originally st- supposed to launch in what, 2008 or something? <laughs> um, I, and they, they keep getting pushed back because yeah, they can launch whenever, right? With planetary, uh-huh. you really, the, the launch periods, you know, due to the configuration of the planets in their orbits are very particular. So yeah, you, you really miss it and then launch. you gotta, you have to wait until the next it, conjunction and... Which who knows how long that's gonna be, right? So. Uh, the planetary, uh, you know, science mission director is extremely conscious of this, and it's very good at making sure that, uh, you know, missions make their launch windows. So does that does especially. that mean that uh, with planetary missions, uh, they're more likely to shave off stuff as the mission launch window approaches? Like, say you're building a contraption, and the launch date is approaching, and you're not, it's not coming together the way you want. Are they more prone to being like, okay, we got to just bag this and move on with? Well, we all have uh, we all have uh, you know different descope options, and that's one of the things uh, that might that might happen. For instance, Kepler originally had an articulated yeah. uh, radio dish. I remember right? that, and, and the, they were over budget, and that that got cut. And of course, that cuts us you know five percent of our data because they were spending all this time pointing the whole spacecraft at Earth. So it's kind of a bummer. Um, but uh, so there, we always have those options. Usually, what you know the solution though is to throw money at the problem at the very at the very end. This okay. is why. Some missions go over budget, and why we got pushed back, right, was because Mars had to launch, and suddenly there's a pandemic, and they need to get these people together, and they basically had to put people working overtime and weekends, uh, which costs money uh, mm-hmm. to get it to go through. It is possible, though. One of the other options is to throw missions off. I know um, the infrared uh, spectrometer I was working on with Cassini, um, we had a, a the, there was a visible visible light spectrometer that was uh, that's part of our suite. Um, and it was a little running behind budget, and JPL did design an eight kilogram brick to attach to the spacecraft in case they didn't get it here on time. But yeah, they made it, so they they put that. <laughs> no, on so that stuff. yeah, because then that changes everything. They the... it off because it would mess up the moment of inertia of the spacecraft, right? Uh-huh. So they literally had an eight kilogram brick of about the same size that was gonna that was gonna fit on there. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> that's that's funny. Um, so uh, when Dragonfly uh, comes in, how does it deploy once it gets there? And then how? And then tell describe the power source that you're going to have. Yeah, so um, uh, Dragonfly, you know, those, for those of you that watched the the recent Mars landing, they call it the seven minutes of terror, and it's shooting through the atmosphere, and it's got a parachute, and it's got radars, and it's got rockets, and all this stuff. Um, Titan, with its low gravity and very thick atmosphere, um, it's a much less stressful process. Parachutes uh, actually so work. Like, well, they're great. Um, I mean, Poygans, the Poygans probe landed on Titan with just a parachute and nothing else. It wasn't even designed to land, right? It just made it. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we call it an hour and a half of mild concern. Although, <laughs> I admit, when I was watching the Mars landing and how nervous I was, and I, I wasn't involved, right? It's probably going to be an hour and a half of terror, let's face it. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, it's much, everything's happening much slower, right? We'll still rip through the atmosphere with a heat shield. We'll deploy a parachute. But then once we get down to about um, a kilometer and a half altitude, we'll let loose. We'll set the, let the parachute and the back shell go, and we'll start flying, looking for a landing site. Oh, so you're going to um, actually do the Apollo-type landings where you have a controlled landing. You've got to guide it in. And the reason for that is, like, this Mars landing, right, the reason they were able to find a safe spot is that they literally took images of the entire site and mapped every rock bigger than this within you know a, a, a 10 kilometer radius around there. So they knew where they were. And as the spacecraft came in, it recognized where it was. It had in its database where all the rocks were and it, and it, and it went to a spot that was, uh, would avoid that. Okay, we so with the, with, the Mars, with, with the Mars landing, um, 
it actually used the topography to orient itself on a pre-existing map and then yes. and then decided presumably the spacecraft had to decide on its own where yeah. it was going to go from there and yeah. that and has to happen huge... that definitely has to happen here because there's no way you got an hour and a half to be like okay here we go yeah, yeah exactly but we don't have the pre-existing database so it has to build up on its own where it's safe so we have a lidar system cameras um, that will be flying around, identifying safe landing sites as we fly. Unlike Mars, right, where they have, uh, you know, a minute and a half of fuel and they've got to put it down. Uh, we can fly for half an hour. So we kind of lazily fly around, flying, finding a, a safe spot. Uh, and once we, you know, ma map out the safe spot that's less than 10 degrees slope uh, and furthest from rocks about this big that would high center us or cause us problems, uh, we put down in that spot. Mm -hmm. How big is the lander itself if you were to stand next to it? It is big, dude. It's like four and a half meters long. Okay. Um, That's like a so it's car. Like this, yeah, it's like, I mean, it's not as, as massive as a car because um, a lot of that space is, you know, just the legs and stuff, propellers and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's big. It's way bigger than a, the, the, than you might think. Uh, and so you asked about the power source earlier, right? I mean, out at Titan, um, the sunlight is 100 times less intense than it is. Uh, at the surface of the earth out in space and once you get down to the surface through all this haze it's another factor of 10. so we really can't use solar power we have a, a nuclear uh, radioisotope power source same as perseverance that just landed mm -hmm. that's exactly the same model it's just uh, uh, called the mmrtg we got the same kind we'll use it to keep ourselves warm and to produce power on the surface of time okay now this is uh those things are uh, it's a plutonium 238 is that what the source is that's right and then it's uh, an alpha emitter, and so it's probably embedded in some kind of ceramic that absorbs the alphas to keep it hot. Um, where do you get the plutonium from? The Libyans? So the plutonium-238 <laughs> um, is generated uh, from Neptunium-238, uh -huh. which, uh, I'm sorry, Neptunium-237. They take Neptunium-237 and they put it in a nuclear reactor and bombard it with neutrons. Where does Neptunium come from? Turns out it's just a byproduct of weapons generation. So uh, down at Idaho National Lab uh, here in my state, uh, they, they have had a huge, huge supply of neptunium that is a bi an accidental byproduct of our nuclear weapons program. Um, and this is sort of a, you know, a sort of a, a swords to plowshares kind of thing where we're mm -hmm. going to take that neptunium uh, and use it for civilian purposes. But you do have to put it in a reactor first uh, to give it that extra, you know, bombard it with neutrons uh, and convert it mm -hmm. into plutonium. Okay, so they have a bunch of reactors, like test reactors and stuff like that, that they can probably um, use. I believe it's in a, a reactor in Oak Ridge that, that this one oh, okay. that we're actually produced. So they ship it all the way across the country to Oak Ridge, they put it in a reactor, and they ship it all the way back uh, to build the MMRTGs there mm -hmm. at Idaho National Lab. So there's a, there's a guy, um, the guy that at Flybe Energy, um, who's looking into uh, molten salt thorium reactors. He was working for NASA, basically like how do you power a, a lunar station? Um, yeah. And so, uh, anyways, he, he went to. Yeah. He grew up near near me, so. Yeah, in in Illinois, there or. All right, in Utah. To, okay, okay. So you went to you went to uh, graduate school. Is that right? Uh, so I was a postdoc in Illinois. Post I went to graduate school. In, yeah, I was a graduate student in Seattle. Um, okay at the University of Washington and then a postdoc right. at Fermi. Okay, sorry, I knew, I knew there was Illinois in your history at some point. I forgot. Yeah, I was, I in, I was gonna, I was anticipating being in Illinois for two years and ended up being nine. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I, had the, I had the lower launch vehicle, a uh, lower mass launch vehicle. And <laughs> so right. I had this, it took me longer it's to get that way. Long, the long tour. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, yeah, nuclear power sources have a long history um, in space flight. Uh, we've developed these the ones like we're using um, are the same ones, uh, very similar actually, not the same model, but very similar to the one on Cassini or on the Voyagers, right? Which launched when we were born and are and now pioneered. still flying, still powered. The pioneers had these things, yeah. So um, these are very low efficiency uh, reactors. Uh, they're not even reactors, right? They're just they're just nuclear batteries effectively. They create yeah, you, just, cold you have this thing and then you the nuclear reaction takes place and you De deliberately want to have the alpha emissions so it's alpha decay you deliberately want to have that embedded like be absorbed by the surrounding material so that it heats up you don't want it to yeah. it's not they're spitting out radioactivity that like you're losing energy if you do that you want it to be exactly. as contained the goal as possible is just the heat the heat is the goal so you just make it hot and you have a cold side and you put a, a, a thermocouple which is a you know just a, a semiconductor device that when you heat one side and cool the other it produces electricity 
very inefficiently. 7% efficiency. But it's no moving parts. And if you want something to live for 50 years going through the solar system, no moving parts is a feature. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I agree with you. If we're looking like building a Mars base, something that's going to keep astronauts from freezing, uh, even during a global dust storm or something, I think uh, a nuclear reactor as part of that uh, you know, energy production suite is, is going to be really important. Yeah, you're not going to use natural gas, that's for sure. <laughs> well, it just I guess freeze, you could. just like it did on in Texas, yeah. right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, you have this power source, and that's going to get you... You have... What's the primary mission and what do you have an extended mission in terms of like the number of samples and things like that? What does your primary mission look like? And then what does an extension to that look like? Yeah, so the primary mission is 3.3 years, three years and four months. Uh, and uh, it's going to encompass that sort of 20 to 30 landing sites. Uh, and we have, um, there's no real consumables for the mass spectrometer. We do have little individual sample cups uh, that we would eventually run out of, but we can reuse them. Um, I know, just dump more stuff in the top of them, uh, and it works okay. So, uh, ostensibly, that would be the, the mission. We're probably not going to sample at every site. Uh, we'll take some pictures at every site. We are very bandwidth limited. Uh, as you can imagine, we're all the way out at Titan. Uh, we just have this little phased array dish on the on our back that, that's going to have to beam all the data back to Earth. So, is that going to be you know articulated, or do you, is that going to be articulated, or do you have to orient the spacecraft um, as you land? Yeah, the, the the dish is two dimensional, two two D gimbal, so it'll be able to it'll be able to point at Earth wherever it is, okay. uh, and no, no matter which orientation we land in. But yeah, you remember that you saw those videos from the per Perseverance landing la uh, last week. We're not gonna get those. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, we only got so many bits. You're gonna get like a little line of data. On a video, a full 4K video of you know 30 frames per second coming down. Now, um, we might get some de descent video uh, images, but they're just gonna be still frames. Mm -hmm. And okay, so you're looking at a couple dozen uh, samples in the primary mission, and then the the hopeful, the optimistic people in the science team. What do they think of as the timeline for the for the, the whole mission? Like when when you run out of the ability to control it, what what are they looking at? Well, to be honest, we're we're we're. I mean, there's we don't have any consumables that are eventually going to necessarily kill us. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's every reason to think that you know we'll run out of money from NASA after they get bored with us okay. um, before we'll run out of, of power, right? I mean, like Cassini or um, like the Voyagers, we, we our, our, our plutonium is going to go for 50 years, uh, and so probably we'll be we'll be knocked out by either you know running out of money uh, or a mechanical failure, or it's possible we'll have a bad day and we'll mm -hmm. we'll, we'll we'll crash on landing or something. Uh, but there's really no, um, like the Mars rovers, which eventually, those two uh, Mars rovers we launched in 2003, eventually did buy it. Um, there's there's no uh, ostensible upper limit to how long we'll be able to last other than several decades. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with Cassini, there were no consumables on Cassini? Well, the ultimate consumable on Cassini was hydrazine for the uh -huh. thrusters, basically right. rocket thrusters, and that's what we ran out of. Okay, uh, that's what I... We, yeah, we're kind of run out of gas, um, and so we wouldn't be able to control our orientation or where we were flying, and so that's what we crashed it into Saturn um, to avoid it accidentally crashing into Enceladus or something. Uh, that's a, that's one way to guarantee signs of life is to crash a spacecraft onto a pristine surface. We know there's life on Mars. We put it there. Uh -huh. All those all those landers we have, we try to clean them up, but dude, Earth is so so gross. There's so much so life everywhere here. So we know uh -huh. there's life on Mars. We sent it. So, um, and then, uh, now about the communication and, and like, what is a typical landing sequence going to look like? Like a typical flight sequence, what's that going to look like? Yeah, well, we have this, um, so we, although the first landing is, is pre, is the, the spacecraft has to find its own site. For subsequent landings, we're going to uh, have the ground in the loop to be able to identify a landing site. So the way we do that is we kind of fly out two thirds of our range, take some pictures, and then we fly back one third of our range and land in the middle. So we keep doing this leapfrog strategy so that we're always landing at a site that's been pre-scouted. So a typical flight is we're gonna take off. Um, we're going to you know, fly out, say 10 kilometers, take aerial imagery of where we wanna go next. And then we'll fly back five kilometers to a site that we've already looked at. The scientists have found an interesting site the engineers have found a totally boring parking lot and we've arrived at some compromise on where we're going to land 
Um, and so the vehicle will be able to actually fly itself to that pre-selected site. What's the what's the field of view on the camera? So like, what what altitude are you going to fly above the surface? And then what's the field of view on the camera so that you can you know know that you've had a decent glimpse of what your options are? Yeah. So we uh, I mean the field of view is about uh, I want to say like thirty or forty degrees on an individual camera. They're fairly wide angle, but once they're downward looking. Um, and then uh, we'll be flying at about a kilometer or so above the surface. We wow, can go lower or higher. That's pretty high. That's cool. It's like way well, up we there. Can fly, we actually, we'll, we'll fly down once we get to the to the prospective landing site. We'll take high-level pictures, and then we'll fly down because we want to really see these rocks that are this big, uh -huh. that are the ones that are, will potentially knock us over. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll take multi-level imagery um, of, the, of, the, of the new site as we go to it. Um, and, of course, we're looking through this Titan haze, which is somewhat – yeah, it's kind of uh, some affects us a little bit, but once we're down that close to the surface, it's it's, it's pretty pretty transparent. We'll be able to see the surface without too much trouble. Uh, is is there concern about uh, dust like wearing out some of the parts? Um, sure. Like yeah, the grit getting in there. What, yeah, we don't know exactly what what the eventual environment is going to be. We I mean our our, our um, motors, for instance, are sealed, um, but okay. there's a chance that stuff is going to get in there. We don't think it's going to be as damaging as stuff on the moon or Mars, right? Lunar dust, for instance, is very angular. Uh -huh. It's all been blasted out. collision and fragments, no air right? Yeah, yeah. They're basically just blasted bits. Uh, but on Titan, everything seems to be rounded, at least from what we've seen on Huygens, due to the atmospheric and, and, and rainfall uh, erosion. So there may be uh, stuff that gets in there, um, but it would... We're trying to design against it, but uh -huh. uh, you can't. See it might everything. even might even facilitate the motion if they just have a bunch of ball <laughs> bearings that get embedded in. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Probably. Well, the other thing is the the motors are heated. Um, they work best around, oh, okay. uh, around room temperature. So you'd be and evaporating so, anything that gets in there. Sure. Exactly. We're, we'll vaporize it. All those organics tend to vaporize it pretty. They're pretty volatile. They'll vaporize at pretty low temperatures. So if uh -huh. stuff gets in. Um, well, it'll probably just be be, be vaporized. Okay, so then you have this uh, site select. You go out, you find something, um, and you're talking 10 kilometers per flight. So you're looking at, you have the ability to probe, presumably in mostly a straight line, um, uh, you know, like a couple hundred kilometers distance. That's like New England size, yeah. you know, a, a New England yeah, I mean, state. <clears throat> I mean, the furthest rovers have gone, um, you know, if we really put our pedal to the metal and really ran it to the edge of the battery, we could probably fly longer in a single flight than uh, Opportunity did in, in its 13 year mission uh, at Mars. So yeah, we actually have a very wide, uh, you know, potential uh, range, but at the same time, we might not use that whole range, but it could be like we saw something interesting. We want to sort of stick around and investigate stuff nearby a mm -hmm. landing site. In addition to these very long flights, we also have the ability to say, hey, ooh, there's that rock over there. Let's just take off and go over there and land next to that other rock. Um, so we actually have um, both a lot of wide flexibility scale and short short scale you know sort of uh mobility yeah so your actual mission is going to be kind of run on the fly you get to make it up as you go it's the wild west and <laughs> yeah very much very much like the, the 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 mars rover missions which we're using as sort of our 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 um, our, our candidate for how we're going to do this is that yeah they're you know curiosity for instance is trying to climb out sharp okay they landed in 2012. They still haven't climbed Mars Sharp, but they found all sorts of cool stuff along the way as they're moving in that direction and investigating the stuff they found on on that traverse. Mm -hmm. And so we expect to be the same way. We kind of have a, a large scale goal, and we're kind of heading there in a in a larger sense. But if we see something um, worthy of worthy of investigation, we can stop and 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 investigate in detail at any point. And we intend to do that, right? We intend to to allow our 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 science to be driven by what we find. Uh -huh. Not just, you know, uh, the dads like us trying to drive somewhere, like driving, like telling all your kids, no, we're going, pee in the Gatorade bottle, we can't stop, you know. No, we don't want to do that. We're going to be uh -huh. like, we see something cool, we're going to stop and investigate. Uh -huh. Wow, this this mission, it gets more interesting, more cool, the more I learn about it. Um, and Titan actually gets more cool, the more I learn about it. I had no idea about, like, the detachment of the, you know, the fact yeah. that the moment of inertia is, is uh, not what you predict. That is that is really cool. Uh, do you have time for a couple questions from yeah, from please. the? So let me go back uh, see what's going on. Um, let's see. The quadcopter. There. What's the projected lifetime of the spacecraft? 
like what's the you know the one that where they say this is when we've achieved success is after we've made it so far I mean, our nominal mission is our baseline design is for these three years and three months, um, three years and four months. Uh, that's what we're really designing toward. I mean, let's face it: like when when NASA says that they're going to build a rover for ninety days, and it lasts a decade, the heck out of that to make sure it's going to live for nine hundred days, and that therefore the ninety days is definitely going to go there, right? Um, and so we we really designed our mission about around being able to get all the way to this impact crater which we think is going to take around that three years, depending on where we land within our landing ellipse. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really what we've designed toward. What really kills things on Mars is actually the thermal cycling, right? It gets relatively warm warm uh, during the day on Mars. And then with that very thin atmosphere, it cools way off. On Titan, uh, with our thick atmosphere, it works like a blanket. Um, we have hardly any day-night um, temperature variation. So we think that there's probably good chance that we'll be able to to, to last a very long time uh -huh. really. now uh speaking of that the uh, i was gonna i had a great question and i don't remember what the question was so uh, if i think of it i'll i'll, I'll come back yeah to yeah. It. yeah ask when it comes back to you um <clears throat> uh so there's a question about uh, let's see so one question is about dust. Is there dust? Is dust going to be affecting this? And I think we covered that. That um, there's going to be some of this dust that forms, but because it's forming in an atmosphere, it's going to form like droplets essentially. Well, um, I mean, it, it's particulates, so it is a problem. Uh, it's maybe a problem. We just don't know what the specific dust environment is going to end up looking like. Um, we do actually have an experiment to figure it out, where like we land and we turn on one of our rotors and we like take pictures of what we blow out to figure out how much dust is there and. Uh -huh. what you know, what's what airspeed we mobilize particular materials all the way up to the sand and the sand dunes it'd be um, cool to take some aerogel and like embed some of the stuff in a <laughs> the, the, see what the the dust is doing. titan sample uh, return mission uh yeah that i i think that's um beyond our lifetimes for sure uh -huh. um it's obviously difficult to get out of that thick atmosphere it's easy to get in hard to get out let's see uh what is how does Saturn affect the environment on Titan? Or is Titan pretty remote from Saturn and therefore there's no real effect? What what kind of interplay well, is there between effects, it? Yeah, we're, um, Saturn, uh, depending on the intensity of the, the solar wind at the time, uh, Titan can either be within Saturn's magnetic field or outside of it, actually. When the solar wind's high, then uh, the magnetic field sort of contracts uh, uh, and, we're, we are, and uh, Titan is exposed to Directly exposed to solar, uh, the solar wind, and when then when the solar wind is less intense, the magnetic field sort of takes back over, and we become within that field again. So that's one of the effects we get, um, and it affects uh, sort of the electro electromagnetic environment. Uh, there's an ionosphere at the type of top of Titan's atmosphere, and its intensity and its, its qualities depend on whether we're embedded in 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 the the Titan. I'm sorry, the Saturn magnetic environment or the solar environment. But would, would that actually, would that affect um, the ability to communicate? Not, uh, not significantly. I mean, we do have to think about it. It's part of our link budget, um, but it's actually just the thick atmosphere itself. Um, just That's it, the, main, the main thing. More, the more main, main worry, yeah. We actually do get some oxygen in the atmosphere of Titan introduced exogenically. Uh, recall, um, Titan's fellow moon there, Enceladus, is spewing water out into space from its uh, south pole and those um, the cryovolcanoes uh, and, and plumes. And some of that material gets embedded in the E-ring, and some of that does find its way to Titan uh, and, and, and introduces oxygen into the atmosphere, at least as water, uh, that can get incorporated to particulates from the outside, which is kind of an interesting and unexpected. Yeah, that is interesting. So where, where is Enceladus's orbit relative to Titan's orbit? far interior um and so this is orbital periods oh it's, it's three or four days whereas titans is 16 let me look that up. okay so that's a factor of five so you're looking at like a factor of 10 or so in it's pretty it's it's pretty close in um but these these particulates once they get out they really diffuse around through through the system mm -hmm. uh, as part of a, a large very diffuse ring uh wow it's at 1.4 days so it's wow, that's right right in there it's 10, it's 10 times shorter period yeah so, um, but that does, but that does enrich the environment in, in basically water vapor. Um, well, well, yeah, ice, yeah. Vapor, oh, water vapor okay. or water ice, yeah. 
Okay, and then and so then that can fall onto the surface. Kind of like we have, you know, dust is always falling onto the surface of the earth. I don't know how many tons we get yep. per year, but it's it's more than one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but this is this instead of just coming from interplanetary space, it's coming from this one source that uh -huh. does have this particular composition. Huh. That's that's really interesting. Okay. Well, there, are there any um, so a, a few I guess final questions professionally uh, yeah. would be how did you how did you get onto this trajectory that uh, put you onto this mission? And um, I guess what what do you see as the future for outer solar system? Because we see Mars stuff all the time. Um, like, what do you see as you know the next twenty years through the rest of your career, the next twenty or thirty years of yeah. like outer solar system exploration and what what missions are out there that you find intriguing and um, beyond Dragonfly. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the dragonfly idea was something um, that, you know, my, I and my colleagues have been thinking about for a while. Um, my friend Ralph Lorenz had suggested helicopters before uh, and landing in the sand dunes before, but it was sort of my idea that, hey, if we land a quadcopter specifically in the sand dunes, we'd be able to sample both the sand and the material, you know, the bedrock between the sand. Uh, oh, because it so gets exposed sort of, from the wind. Yeah, actually, it's, dunes are amazing, man. Like somehow there's this hundred meter high pile of sand, and right next to it, there's no sand at all. And then a um, kilometer down, there's another hundred meter high mountain of sand. This is a self, you know, organizing process where the sand builds itself into dunes, uh -huh. and in between those dunes are what are called interdunes that expose, you know, whatever's uh, below the dunes of the local bedrock. Yeah, so um, so, so that happens because really easily. that happens because when the wind blows, so if you have a per, like a protuberance, when the wind blows across it, uh, the velocity of the the wind has to speed up and it acts like an aerofoil, and so the pressure drops, which pulls more stuff in, um, and then and then it's yeah. higher, and so the wind when the wind blows out, there's an even bigger pressure drop, and so it um, creates a when you have a a bump on the surface, the bump tends to grow because there's this positive it's feedback. Self organizing, loop. yeah, and the amazing thing is. It, it seems to happen on all sorts of different planets. We even see it on comets and stuff that were the really? material. Seems to, yeah, it's a crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> it seems to organize itself into individual dunes instead of just spreading out. Yeah. Well, that, that's um, cool. So, so that's where the idea came from, uh, and we were able to propose it. And it's the Applied Physics Laboratory that really turned it into uh, you know an actual thing, like this you know this 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 thing behind me. Uh, I this is not anything about what I thought like what I thought it was going to look like, right? I thought it was just going to be a little platter with some propellers on it, um, and they really they really brought the design into into something that could really could really happen. Uh, as far as the outer solar system, uh, you know, for a while there it was looking pretty grim. Once Cassini was going to end, it was looked like we were going to have nothing in the outer solar system at all. Uh -huh. But uh, NASA's really come through. There are a bunch of different ideas uh, moving forward, including um, Juno is still operating there at Jupiter. Uh, the Europa mission is going to be really important. I think we will um, possibly get some other future competing missions, uh, like from the uh, ongoing discovery round of missions. There are some competitors there from the outer solar system. But one of the next big things we want to do, actually, is to study, send an orbiter around Uranus or Neptune, the same way we have around Jupiter and Saturn. Yeah, I know uh, <laughs> that some friend, mutual friends of ours have been advocating yeah. for a, a Uranus or, or, or Neptune mission um, for a while now. Yeah, I mean, both because these are hardly explored missions. Voyager 2 just flew past. Yeah, we have like 10 days of data for both of them combined, something like that. Yeah, just nothing. Um, but also, you know, when you look at exoplanets, we find just a metric ton of planets in that size range, right? The, you know, Uranus and Neptune type stuff for Earth radii, uh, you know, the, the the galaxy is just, just littered with this stuff. Uh, this is, but these are the ones, the local bodies that we can actually study in detail, um, and we're not going to, we're not going to, unfortunately, get to those exoplanets in our lifetimes. But mm -hmm. this will allow us to sort of study both these solar system planets and hopefully get a sense for what this huge fraction of the exoplanet population might be like as well. All right, excellent. Well, I really appreciate your time. Uh, any last comments? We'll let you close it out with like the, you know, the future is bright because. Um... <laughs> No, I'm just real excited. I'm just really pleased by the support that we've had for this mm -hmm. crazy mission idea from both the public and uh, the other scientists. I mean, like most scientists, when I told them this, they're like, that sounds crazy. But when you think about it and when you read our proposal, you realize that 
actually, it's really not crazy. It's really a very, uh, you know, in some ways conservative and a very achievable, uh -huh. if ambitious, uh, mission. And I think that's why we ended up going forward. And I'm really looking forward to bringing you all to Titan with us in yeah. uh, the mid 2030s. That's a, a it's an amazing mission. When when you spoke uh, a few weeks ago, I was like. Wow, I need to. This needs to get out there. People need to know about this because I mean, yeah. Mars missions. Yeah, I mean, they're they're interesting, but to some extent, they're a dime a dozen because it's so close and there's so many of them. Um, that uh, well, okay, so it's more than a dime, but it's twelve cents for a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, it's more like uh, ten billion a dozen, but still. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and not to you know, there's nothing wrong with Mars. Mars is like, you know, in my mind, at least until the last couple of weeks, was the second most interesting object in the solar system after the Earth. <laughs> Um, but I'm yeah. starting to think that Titan actually might surpass Mars in terms of the overall interestingness that it has available I really to it. I think that Titan, Titan is, is, you know, Titan and Mars are the two most interesting places we should be exploring. I mean, not other places are interesting too. We should also explore those. Yeah. I don't mean your, your hope is interesting, but but this thing, this thing, like the the fact that it's near the triple point of some substance, some volatile substance, um, yep. really adds a lot of. Uh, depth to the science that you can get out of it in terms of like exploring a, a total alien environment where you know it's not the liquid is actually a different solvent instead of water um yeah it's yeah. Uh, it seems and, really cool i mean the one thing lacking on mars i think is carbon and organics and that's the one thing that that titan has in abundance there's just organic material everywhere mm -hmm. uh, and it really brings uh brings to mind you know the exciting possibilities as far as prebiotic chemistry and possible formation of life itself yeah very, very cool. Hey, Jason, I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking, uh, answering my questions uh, about, yeah, about this mission. So, um, All right. Well, great to have the chance to do so. Yeah. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. Sounds All right. good. Uh -huh. Bye, everybody. Bye.